Hey guys, welcome back to a brand new episode of the show. And on this episode, I'm going to be talking about Star Crash. That's right, Star Crash. Now I know you're probably thinking, Mark, why do you have duct tape over your Star Wars shirt? Well, because again, I'm trying to reiterate here that this is not Star Wars. It's completely different. Now let's take a look at this poster right away because you're probably thinking, hmm, that looks pretty similar to Star Wars. Well, get those thoughts out of your head right now because this is not Star Wars. It's completely different. It is its own, uh, un you know, just unique and original film. <clears throat> I mean, sure, the movie came out a year after Star Wars, but the director insists that it was written and the whole design of the film was made before Star Wars. So that's gotta be true. Because he said it. Any similarities that you see are either coincidental or just prove that Star Crash didn't rip off from Star Wars. It's actually the other way around. That's right. Star Wars, if anything, ripped off from Star Crash. That is why I have the duct tape on my shirt and why I don't think I can be a Star Wars fan anymore. Because after, you know, watching this movie, uh, all I, my, my Star Wars collection, just is, it's just shelves and shelves of lies. That's all I see. I know George Lucas always said, oh, well, you know, I was always inspired by the, uh, the sci-fi serials and Flash Gordon and uh, the Hidden Fortress. Well, that's all garbage. It's pretty clear to me that he heard about Star Crash and somehow, um, you know, got a hold of the script and the storyboards and, you know, all the production design and said, well, I'm just gonna rip this off and become a billionaire. You know, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna happen. And that did happen. You know, look where he is now. And, and where are the people that made Star Crash? I don't know. But, you know, it's, it's pretty clear to me that the Star Wars is just a giant plagiarism. Um, on Star Crash. This is not Star Wars. It's completely different. And you know what? I'm gonna go through and just show you how different it is. <laughs> the movie starts with this shot of a spaceship, which is completely different than the opening shot of Star Wars because in Star Wars, there's two ships. So there you go. Anyways, this ship is looking for some kind of a weapon when all of a sudden there's these red balls and they appear out of nowhere and cause everyone on the ship to get terrible headaches and collapse on the floor. A couple of escape pods detach from the ship as it flies towards the planet and just suddenly explodes. And now we have our opening credits and here you'll notice that the logo for Star Crash moves towards the camera when in Star Wars it moves backwards. See? Totally different. We're talking polar opposites here, people. You know, one's going towards, one's going back. So now we have Stella Star and Acton, two smugglers who get pulled over by the space police. Now I know what you're thinking. Smugglers? Just like Han and Chewbacca. Wrong! Okay? Completely different. Han is a man. Stella is a woman. This guy doesn't have nearly as much hair as Chewbacca and their spaceship doesn't even have any cool thrusters on it. So anyways, Thor, the chief of police, and L, the police robot, tell them to surrender at once, but instead they go into hyperspace. Which again, in Star Wars, hyperspace is blue, and in this, it's red. Totally different. What? You gonna sit there and argue that blue and red are the same color? And clearly not. This is like stuff you learned in primary school here, people. Come on. So, moving on. After they come out of hyperspace, they find that they're about to be destroyed because they came out too close to a neutron star. Eject! Eject! Then they find one of the escape ships from the beginning of the movie, so Stella decides to take a look. So she swims over to the ship and just goes inside. I can only guess this is super advanced space equipment here. And she finds a crew member unconscious and brings him back to their ship somehow. Just wondering how you did this. I mean, uh, getting him back to this, the ship without a suit. You're just gonna expose him to the vacuum of space. 
uh, I don't know, somehow I feel like that would throw a wrench in the whole rescue effort thing. It turns out that the guy is just in shock, mumbling about red monsters. But that doesn't matter because the space police have followed her space trail, and now she's surrounded. Anyways, now we're introduced to the bad guy, Count Zarth Arn. Zarth, not Darth. And one of his downvote troopers tells him that there's a survivor from the ship they destroyed with their super special space weapon. So Zarth summons his golems to, I don't know, go and assassinate this guy, I guess. Meanwhile, Stella and Acton are sentenced to a lifetime of hard labor by Krang. Now we see Stella carrying out her sentence. I guess these are her work clothes, which are different than every other prisoner's clothes for some reason. And Stella is like, hey, I don't really like this. So she starts planning an escape out in the open, which I guess is very frowned upon for some reason. Planning an escape? This is what you're gonna get, lady. So now an all-out laser fight takes place, and I have to say, this is actually pretty cool. But apparently a laser shot to this you know, furnace or whatever is enough to blow up the whole place. So I guess seems like it wasn't the best idea to use lasers as a security measure here. So now Stella is running through a field, which is weird. I thought it was nighttime, but who knows? Maybe blowing this place up turned the sky blue. The chief of police and the robot tell Stella that they came here to set her free because her sentence has been cancelled. So I guess starting that prison riot which killed a bunch of people was actually completely unnecessary. Oops. Imagine how pissed they're gonna be when they find out about that. So they free Acton and Christopher Plummer shows up in a hologram as the Emperor. I come to you because my faithful robot, L, has told me that you are the only one who could save us. You know, you must be the best pilot in the whole galaxy. I'm just wondering, what is it that makes her the best pilot in the galaxy? We haven't seen anything that proves she's even a good pilot. So far, we've seen her go into hyperspace to get away from the cops, come out of hyperspace so close to a star that they had to eject out of their ship just to make it out alive, and then the cops just found them anyways. And why is she the only one who can save them from this special weapon? I mean, what special talent does she have? Losing her ship? Almost killing everyone on board? Getting caught? Starting a prison riot that killed several people. Anyways, the Emperor explains that the galaxy has been split into two warring factions. There's the faction led by Count Zarth from the League of the Dark Worlds, not the dark side. The dark, the, what is it again? The League of the Dark Worlds. That sounds so much cooler. I mean, the dark side is just a side. You know, this is a League of Dark Worlds. That's jacked. And he's developed a weapon so big, so massive, that it would take an entire planet to conceal it. Now don't even think about Star Wars here, okay? Don't even, don't, it's not, it's... Coincidences happen! So the Emperor is like, find the planet with the weapon, and uh, find my son, too. He was one of the people on the escape pods. Stella takes a craft and lands on the planet, assisted by L the robot. Now, again, I know where your mind is going as a Star Wars fan, and just stop, because L and C-3PO are completely different. They're not the same at all. I mean, uh, do they look the, the same? No. And they're, you know what? You just listen to this. Their accents are completely different. Where do you think you're going? Well, I'm not going that way. What makes you think there are settlements over there? Well, it certainly is an antique. This planet is inhabited. Look, Amazon's on horseback. I hope they're friendly. So the Amazons show up, and the Amazon Queen is watching this whole thing on a screen. I don't know how she's watching it from this angle, unless there's just some sort of camera in this spot that they never noticed. So they take them into, I don't know, some room. All the rooms look the same. And then they just rush them. They shoot Elle, but Stella's not having any of it, so they take her away, and for some reason, they leave a gun on the floor right next to Elle. And I bet you can guess what happens. The queen is like, hey, I'm on the Count's team. You'll never find his planet. 
And then L shows up and gets them to drop their weapons. Release her or I'll blast your queen. I mean it. Come on now. Don't you people move or you're dead. You mean to treble and I'm gonna clean out your sinuses real good, lady. Now you stand there. Okay, close the door. And couldn't you have, you know, added in some kind of sound effect to make these laser guns not sound like cheap pieces of painted wood? I mean it. Anyways, the queen goes over to her TV and shoots some laser beams from her eyes into it. Apparently this summons the giant robot with the serrated nipples. And the action and the acting here is really top notch. You really get the feeling this is gonna be a truly epic fight. Look! Whoa! Run for your life! I guess it's a good thing the guys back on the ship had the feeling that something was wrong because they're able to make short work of this thing and help Elle and Stella escape, but not before they send out their own space fighters to stop them. So they have to use the laser cannons and fight them off, which gives us yet another brilliant scene which is completely unique and unlike anything we've ever seen in a movie that came out the year before. Why don't you come back now? Here they come, Spectre 3. Fire! Fire! Yeah! Now, I don't want to come off as a stickler or anything like that, but I take issue with the math in this scene. So when the scene starts, it shows that they're clearly being chased by six fighters. Then suddenly, in the next shot, there's only five. Then after they kill three ships, Stella says, One more! There's one more! But then in the next shot, there's clearly three, and then Stella says, We're down from six to five. So I really don't know what's going on here, but the reactions are priceless, and there's many more of these throughout the film. All right, we've won. We did it. So they go to the planet where the mothership crashed and they don't find any survivors, so they have to go on this super long walk back to the ship. Makes me wonder why they didn't land the ship closer to the crash. Meanwhile, aboard the ship, Thor takes out Acton because apparently he's working for the Count, but the ship won't take off because there's some kind of a malfunction. Better shine a light on these circuit boards and see if I can find out what's wrong. And then Stella gets to the ship. She's like, hey, let us in. And Thor's like, no, screw you. You're going to freeze to death. So then they just start walking away like, oh, well, I guess we're dead. Instead of trying to find some way to get into the ship. I mean, come on. Something tells me this thing isn't exactly sealed like a vault. I mean, he can hear you talking to him outside the ship. Anyway, Stella's pretty much accepted her fate until Elle comes up with the idea to keep her heartbeat going while the rest of her body freezes by holding her hand and transferring energy or some crap. Pretty sure that's not how that would work, but whatever, it's a space movie. Meanwhile, it turns out that Acton isn't dead and we get this hilarious fight scene. <laughs> just happened there it's like he activated some kind of god mode and just starts karate chopping the hell out of this guy because lasers don't even hurt him now i mean i get that he's an alien but why not just stay in this mode all the time so he manages to stop the laser blasts and reflect them back towards thor using some kind of invisible power then they bring in the frozen stella and thaw her out which is amazing i mean Obviously, she's wet from the thawing of the ice, but then she's suddenly completely dry and even her makeup is fixed. So she changes out of her now dry clothes and into something more appropriate for space travel. But as they get close to the planet where the three escape pods landed, they get attacked by the secret weapon and the red balls are everywhere. And then it's just over suddenly. I guess they survived it. And then they land on a planet where 
They're attacked by cavemen who really hate robots. So they capture Stella and hang her upside down until some guy in a mask shows up and starts shooting laser beams out of his eyes. The mystery man takes her into a cave to rest, takes off his helmet, and holy crap, it's David Hasselhoff. I guess he's the Emperor's son. Now the cavemen rush in and start to attack them, but it's okay because Acton comes in and draws his laser sword. Okay. All right. Okay. I tried. Honestly, I tried. That's it. I tried, Star Crash. I tried defending you, but this is just ridiculous. I mean, it, it's, it's all Star Wars. The whole thing is Star Wars. It's the most blatant ripoff I've ever seen. You know what it's like? It's like uh, it's like an asylum version of Star Wars. And the fact that they try and brush it off is just so ridiculous. Oh, we did it first. We came up with this stuff before Star Wars. We swear. I mean, our movie came out a year after, but oh, we 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 we, we promised we did it. For give me a break. How stupid do you think people are? And you know what? It gets worse. You're gonna see in a minute. It gets much worse. So they find the weapon control room, but the count shows up and tells them that. He was basically using them to lure in the Emperor and then self-destruct the weapon so that he'll be king of the universe or whatever. And here's a great example of some bad dubbing. Watch the Count's mouth here as he's supposed to be laughing. <laughs> Acton fights off the robots with his light sword, which has changed color now. He destroys one of the robots by stabbing it, and it just slowly disappears. The other robot manages to cut his arm, which is, I guess, an injury he just can't recover from. I mean, you gotta wonder why he didn't turn on god mode for this fight. Anyways, the Hoff takes care of the other robot, and Acton pulls a Yoda. The Emperor shows up, and they're like, oh crap, this place is gonna explode. We're, we'll all be killed. And... The Emperor apparently has a ray beam on the ship that can stop time for three minutes, which allows them to escape. <laughs> not one, not five, but three, you know, right in this sweet spot. We feel that stopping time for three minutes, you, you can get a lot done. So now comes the big attack on Count Zarth Arm, or Arn, or whatever, with ships and ships and ships and ships and ships, and ships, and ships, and more ships, and ships, and ships. <laughs> Zarth's claw ship closes a bit. I guess this is what? It's defense mode? <laughs> Doesn't look like it's really gonna do anything, but okay. <laughs> and now we have a bunch of shots, which Quite a, just look at this. Seriously, dude, if you wanted to try and convince people you didn't rip off Star Wars, maybe don't do a shot-for-shot -shot remake of the climax of the movie. Also, here's some more hilarious pieces of acting. Enemy arriving with torpedoes. Prepare for attack. Kill! Kill! Over there! Kill! Kill! So now the strategy is to literally shoot torpedoes filled with troops through the windows of the ship. <laughs> and that's exactly what they do. Like, hello? I, I guess space being a vacuum, not that big of a deal. I mean, if exposing everyone to space isn't a problem, then why do you even have space suits? Why did Stella wear this ridiculous helmet? Fashion? Honestly, out of all the things that happen in this movie, I got this is the dumbest one. Ah, it's getting kind of stuffy in this spaceship. Oh, let's just open up a few windows. <laughs> it should be fine. Get, get me some of that fresh space air. <laughs> like, just look at this shit. Anyways, blah, blah, blah. Christopher Plummer tells the audience everything is good. And the end. The sets are pretty low budget. And, you know, quite honestly, I think that's kind of a big thing. Because you never really get the feeling like... You know, they're on a spaceship. It's just a set. The miniatures don't do this thing any favors either because once the camera gets close enough, it's painfully obvious that they're miniatures. I mean, what else is there really to say about this? Other than, you know, it comes off as not just a low-rent version of Star Wars, but pretty much a low-rent version of any space movie you've ever seen. I have to say, it was fun watching this movie, just, you know, just going through all the comparisons and just... 
thinking to myself, wow, you know, they actually they really tried to convince people that they didn't rip off Star Wars. Anyways, I hope you guys had fun watching this one. As usual, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.